e ki mi ai au i ai o ka ki mi au ki fea ka ki mi au ki tai ka ki mi au ki fea ka ki mi au ki uta ka ki mi au ki fea ka ki mi au ki runga ka ki mi au ki fea ka ki mi au ki raro ka ki mi au ki fea ka ki mi au ki waho ka ki mi au ki fea ka ki mi au ki roto e ki mi ai au i ai o i o i te wānanga Ho, pai marire. Tō te a ki ngā māramatanga whakaoranga e te atua, ki ngā ki tō mātou ki ngī ki atu hei tia ki tōna whare kā huiriki, ki runga ki ngō mātou tinana e mā wiwi ngā ana heo tira, ki runga ki te kaupapa o te ahia hinei ai. Nā au te koro, Tuia te rangi e tūnei, tuia te papa e takoto nei. Tuia rātou koe hea atu ki te pō uri uri, te pō tango tango, te pō i o te atu. He kula i tangi hea he mai mai aroha nā te ki ingi Māori. He takahi nei te nuku o te whenua. Te kaua i ngā pale kawa kawa ki runga ki ngā mate o te motu. Nō reira koutou e pīkau mai nā i o koutou mate. Tātou e pīkau nei i o tātou mate. Tū hono tia ai. Kia ua rā rangi kupu, he kule i tangihia he mai mai aroha. Ko ngā kura, kā tangihia i rote i te pō nei. Ko ngā kupu kōrero a tō tātou ranga tira. Te amo kapua o te pua wānanga ki te ao. Aho rangi o te whare wānanga o waikato. Nō reira, hare mai tātou, hare mai tātou. Are mai tātou, ka tahuri ki te rangatira, te tumuaki o te whare wānongo o Waikato, Neil Quigley, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Kia ora hui hui tātou katoa. Nā rā rangatira mā, tēnā koutou katoa. E te rangatira e tāmei, nau te karakia me ngā mihi whakatau, nā reira tēnei ka mihi. Ko ngā mihi ki a kingi tu heitia, ko tāko nei he tautoko. E mihi ana hoki, ki a koutou katoa, ku a taimai nei i tēnei ahi ahi, ngā pākeke, ngā ahurangi me ngā pūkenga, ngā kaimahi me ngā tauira. Nau mai haira mai koutou o tira tātou katoa. E te ahurangi e Brendan, nau mai haira mai. Ngā te pūkenga, kei te mihi, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Nā reira, e te whakamenenga, Nau mai haere mai rā, ki te kauhau o ahurangi Brendan Hokofitu, tō tātou kai kōrero i te pō nē. Tēnā koutou, tēnā hui hui tātou katoa. It's my pleasure to be here this evening to welcome you to Professor Brendan Hokofitu's inaugural professorial lecture. Brennan has recently begun his appointment as Dean of Te Pua Wānanga Ki Te Ao, the School of Māori and Pacific Development at this university. Professor Hokafitu is a leading Māori academic who spent four years in Canada as Dean and Professor of the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta in Edmonton before returning to New Zealand 
to take up this position. Professor Hokofitu is of Ngati Pukenga descent and grew up in Opotiki in the Bay of Plenty. He spent a year at the University of Waikato before completing a Bachelor of Physical Ed Education and Bachelor of Arts at the University of Otago. He did a Master's at the University of Victoria in Canada and then a PhD at Otago. Before becoming a lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor and associate dean Māori in Te Tumu, the School of Māori, Pacific and Indigenous Studies at the University of Otago. During his 10 years in Dunedin, he developed the first completely online master's degree program in Tangata Whenua Studies. Some of Professor Hokafitu's early research was a historical analysis into Māori sport and rugby in particular. And that in turn led to his work in Māori masculinity and thinking about stereotypes surrounding indigenous men. He found out that physicality was an underpinning idea that was linked to colonial history in general. His more recent research has been in Māori media and indigenous media and how Māori men are portrayed in the media. Professor Hokafitu has written more than 40 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. He was the lead editor of Fourth Eye, Māori Media in Aotearoa, New Zealand, published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2013, and he was also an editor of Indigenous Identity and Resistance, Researching the Diversity of Knowledge, published in 2010 by Otago University Press. This work brought together the work of Indigenous Studies scholars in Canada, New Zealand and the Pacific in research conversations that transcended uh, the imperial boundaries of the colonial nations in which they are located. His work in Canada has extended his understandings of Indigenous cultures, the similarities and differences between different Indigenous peoples. And while he was in Canada, he was an inaugural elected officer of the Native America and Indigenous Studies Association, a key association in the developing field of Indigenous Studies. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Professor Hokofitu uh, to Te Whare Wānanga ki te au, uh, and to Te Whare Wānanga o Waikato. It's a privilege to have such a distinguished scholar uh, here at this university uh, and a privilege to welcome him uh, to give his inaugural lecture on post-colonial formations of Māori masculinity. Brendan, no mai, haere mai, please, welcome, please join me in welcoming Professor Brendan Hokofitu to the lectern. Wakato Horo Pounami. Tui ai te mā tauranga ki te heningaro hei teki teki mō tō mā a māhunga. Tui ai te wānanga ki a puta ki tai ātea, ti hei mauri ora. Wakato whenua o wakato tangata tēnā koe. Tainui waka ānei a taimihi tangata tēnā koutou. E ngā mana e ngā reo e te hāpori o kirikiri rō tēnā koutou. Kei te upoko o te whare wānongo o Waikato e te ahorangi neo quickly tēnā koe. Kei te whare wānongo o Waikato whānui tēnā koutou. Kei taku kura te pua wānonga ki te ao tēnā hoki tātou. Kia ora koutou. 
So I would uh, like to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, apparently, I'm a bit of a guinea pig for this new uh, indigenous, no, sorry, not indigenous, inaugural professor <laughs> lectures. Um, in this new format, we are meant to talk about our key research ideas that span our careers and um, give you some key messages. Uh, even though I'm new to the University of Waikato, I was fairly disappointed to hear that uh, we are no longer allowed to talk about our life's journey and our um, cool conference that I went to with my nerdy indigenous buddies. Um, but the biggest no-no apparently is that we can't talk about our cats. Um, the other notion I'm meant to focus on is aha moments, my research career aha moments. Those existential moments when I've exclaimed, Eureka, I found it. Hmm. I can tell you when you're an indigenous person working in the field of postcolonial studies, those moments are very far and few between. Um, indeed, the moments that I've come up with are more like, ah, oh, come on, are you serious? And, ah, oh, bloody hell. So I just wanted to briefly talk about the, my research, uh, really briefly. So I've looked into sports, physicality, gender masculinity, um, indigenous critical theory, and popular culture. But of course tonight I'll be focusing on one area of that, which is, well, sport and, and masculinity. Um, so tonight I'll, I'll do some, some personal reflections, um, a little bit about methodology, uh, I can see people are really happy about that. Um, a section about physical, uh, called Physically Educating Jake, and um, then also talk about Māori and Victorian masculinity. And lastly, tradition and existentialism. So I'm going to do all of this with my academic work, of course, but also some philosophising and some poetry thrown in there as well. Um, speaking of poetry, I would like to acknowledge my mother, Gaynor, who is here, who's a avid poet, and um, she travelled here tonight to be with me, with her partner David. Also, e tuku hoa rangatira nalani, um, she's here to, my wife is here to afi me tonight as well. Luckily she didn't bring the kids, because they'd be like all over the place. Um, I should also tell you that I was born and bred in a, and schooled in Oportiki, uh, where both my parents were school teachers, um, however I'm Ngāti Pukinga, uh, Ngāti Pukinga ki maku tu. Um, also, I should forewarn you that uh, this kind of talk tonight kind of verges on narcissism, you know, that kind of my life story. But in my defense, I am a Māori man after all. <laughs> so here's the narcissistic bit. That's me, of course. Um, so I'll start off with a bit of poetry. Red with cold, Māori boy feet speckled with blades of colonial gl uh, green, glued with dew, west water wet down from Raukumara Mountains, wafted up east from Timuana, Timuana Nui Akiwa. Anxiety, ambu ambiguity, madness. So my physicality begins, as with many young boys of my time, before and after with rugby. I see morning dew upon my bare feet and legs as my lasting memory of playing JB rugby on Saturday mornings on Poriki College uh, fields, as my colleague Dick Tekahutu can attest to. The wet was cold and exhilarating, and with the right skill, um, it enabled evasion of captors as they slid one way as I went the other, other way towards greener pastures. The feeling I remember was one of liberation in those moments where speed, deception, dew, and inertia combined to open up the space for a headlong dash to the waste oil marked tri line. In the 1970s and 1980s, rugby was a central part of the Oporiki community and beyond. A, a community that comprised of equal parts descendants of settler ancestors and indigenous ancestors. I'm not sure how it all worked, this, uh, this amalgam, this rural community of affluent and working class Pakeha kids, and Māori kids predominantly from a rural underclass. This, the history of colonial dispossession was not clear to any of us, except in our bodies. Freedom was an embodied experience on a rugby field that earlier had been part of a parcel of lands dispossessed by colonial injustice. So let's go back a bit. I want to firstly acknowledge the work of Ranginui Walker, who passed away very recently. He was, amongst many other things, a preeminent Māori historian and an activist, and who was born close to Portiki and spent his childhood there, and is, of course, Whakatohia. 
I want to draw from his 2007 book, O Portiki Mai Tafiti, The Story of Whakatoya's Struggle, to locate my brief personal introduction and a bit of colonial history. In 18, this is a quote from, obviously, from Walker's book. In 1865, the government invaded Oportiki with an uh, army of 500 troops to arrest Kiriopa Te Rau, a ho-ho partisan of the Arawa tribe. Whakatohe bore the brunt of that invasion under martial law, including the looting and destruction of property, the wrongful execution of Mokomoko for the killing of Volkner, the confiscation of Oportiki lands, and the confinement of a 511 Whakatohe survivors of a native reservation of, on second-class land at Ōpape. The wrongful confiscation included close to 70,000 hectares of Whakatohe land that under the military settler scheme was taken up by mainly um, settlers who, as Walker outlines, became the families, the businessmen, and the landed gentry of Oportiki. These families and their descendants, and the descendants of Mokomoko and other, other Whakatohe, um, they all featured pretty prominently in my life, being raised and schooled at a, por at a Portiki primary and then a Portiki college. My own lift lived history told me that colonisation was not an abstract thing for Māori people. For me, my mates whose families ended up scraping um, in the state houses of Portiki's High Street, while my other mates, they owned multi-million dollar dairy farms and kiwi fruit orchards. So 116 years after the invasion, it was 1981. I was 10 years old and looked forward to evading the descendants of Mokomoko and the Oportiki landed gentry every Saturday morning. It was also the year that Oportiki's one and only all-black Frank Shelford was to don the all-black jersey. After weeks earlier starring for the Māori All Blacks against the touring South African Springboks, Whakatohe's Shelford was called into the all-black starting lineup for the de decisive third test at Auckland's Eden Park. As you will all know, the test has become folkloric in New Zealand history due to its violent protests around the game, including a plane that flew around um, the park and peppered the field with flower bombs and flares. The tour split the nation along ideological lines, bypassing racial lines in, in many instances, with Māori and Pākehā alike, both pro and anti the tour. Although supposedly protesting ap apartheid in South Africa and the, Mold the Muldoon-led national government, um, the event signaled New Zealand's postmodern moment, where a decade of protest by, by many groups um, congealed to resist that rugby establishment. An oppressive monocultural oligarchy, a rugby racing and beer society. So as a 10-year-old, I watched the Springbok tour <coughs> unfold alongside a Māori father, whose passion for rugby emulated my own, my father's bottom line that politics should stay out of sport um, and supporting the tour contrasted my liberal and feminist Pākehā mother's stance against the tour, which aligned with discourses that sprung from urbane centres um, in, US, in the US and Europe. The tour, for her, signified a broader um, suppression. But my father's stance was not as simplistic as it might appear. Born into a different era, educated at Pungakawa Native School and subject to various disciplinary forms of racism, he valued the inclusion of Māori and rugby as a source of pride. Rugby in particular was one of the only institutions where Māori were able to compete on a level playing field with, with Pākehā. And I will outline in more detail, um, but throughout colonial history it was a strategic avenue into a political world do dominated by Pākehā. Okay, so looking back, it all seems like a farce to me. Māori and Pākehā, kids mauling together on wrongfully confiscated lands, a Māori father supporting a racist tour. I think these roots not only made me a fairly confused wee lad, but sowed the seeds of complexity that my research now attempts to unpack. It taught me that seldom is life simple, or even how it appears. I guess it was the murmurings of a methodology concerned with how we are produced as colonised citizens. I'm not sure you could ever describe the analysis of power as an aha moment. Um, it's more like a slowly growing appendage that kind of just takes hold of you. But there are two basic points I would like to make in relation to power that have helped in my research. 
Um, firstly, in, in particular relation to indigenous masculinities, typically we think of power in terms of hier a hierarchical imbalance, uh, an oppressive vertical relationship between, say, Pākehā and Māori, or men and women. Uh, the study of indigenous masculinities, however, enables us to see power as productive and complex. One of the fresh insights that enables um, indigenous studies, masculinity studies enables, is it makes it possible to understand power beyond the, that kind of dialectic of a single binary. Or more simply put, indigenous men have the capacity at least to be both the oppressed and the oppressor. They have been dispos dispossessed in many ways due to colonization but simultaneously, they have also gained access to power simply by being a man within a colonial system that has unquestionably been a gendered project. Secondly, when we talk about colonization in indigenous studies circles at least, it is typically described in oppressive or suppressive terms for good reason. But I'm more interested in the productive nature of colonialism. How and why did indigenous peoples become conscious subjects of colonization? How did Māori men, for instance, interact with colonization and modernity to produce new forms of post-colonial masculinity? So it is my belief that our post-colonial indigenous subjectivities emerge from their confrontation with death associated with colonization. Māori had to reconstruct ourselves, our culture in the face of death. And when I say death, I'm not being flippant, there are estimates that suggest from the 19th century to the early 20th century that the Māori population um, decreased by as much as high as 90%. And there are other estimates that say it was as low as 50%. Regardless, it was commonly expected by the turn of the century that all Māori would die out over the course of the 20th century. Again, we often think about colonisation as systematically oppressive, but more than anything else, it was systematically productive. I don't mean productive and necessarily a good way, rather a strategic way, given that in order to survive colonialism, Māori had to become colonial citizens. Post-colonial indigenous cultural formations, that is, the things that Māori began to do when staring death in the face, were strategic, industrious and creative, and Māori masculinities were at the centre of that reconstruction. So that's power. Now I want to briefly talk about genealogy as a method, and I, I guess, um, again, I apologise, I don't think even the ardent methodologists among us could honestly relate method to a sexy aha moment. But what I've done so far, um, with just a wee bit of help from others like Foucault, is work out a methodology that attempts to comprehend the, the nature of power in the colonial context, a method that both Nietzsche and Foucault refer to as genealogy. Now, it seems odd to, word, to use the word genealogy in relation to power, but I use it at least in relation to the molecular descent of colonization. At the core of this methodology is the rejection that materiality and the body is somehow divorced from theory, abstract thought and history. Let us think about genealogy as the passed down DNA, the physiology of colonization. Or possibly, and I'll ask for a little license here, the papa of colonization, whereas Foucault would say bodies are totally imprinted by history. The stereotype, for instance, that Māori are a physical race produced certain post-colonial indigenous subjectivities, whether that was in the army, in physical labor, in physical education, sport, in the laundry, on the farm, in the kitchen, or at the end of a shovel. In indigenous studies, we've become hung up on representation, representations in anth anthropological texts, in paintings, in postcards. But how do the sites of physical production interact with these representations to produce bodies? Sites of work, leisure, domestic life, schools and practices such as eating, cleaning and exercising. How do these material activities discipline the indigenous body? Colonization wasn't just mere abstract discourse, it just didn't lead to stereotypes. Bodies were produced in relationship with the material existence. Discourses were fleshed out, so to speak. DNA was passed down. Now, I was thinking last night that this might be the place where I lose people, and people might start nodding off, but uh, hopefully that's not the case. Um, so I will go on to talking about physically educating Jake, and of course I'm referring to Jake the Mas Heke. Um, so yeah, I want to 
discuss in the next little part of my talk what I've just talked about in theory. Um, so Māori people of my grandparents and parents' generation, they acquired different relationships to their bodies than the educated settlers. Because native schools in New Zealand, firstly, they did not allow Māori to get academic qualifications. And secondly, they trained Māori in what I came to refer to as a physical education. And here I just want to offer but one example of the discourse of the day. Uh, the headmaster of a Māori boarding, sorry, yeah, the headmaster of a Māori boarding school told the Young Māori Party in 1910 that Māori were not fitted to the various professions. He said, and I quote, about 999 out of 1,000 could not bear the strain of higher education. In commerce, Māori could not hope to compete with the Pākehā. In the trades, the Māoris were splendid copyists, but not originators. As carpenters, they would cope under a capable supervisor, but not otherwise. Agriculture was the one calling suitable for Māoris. It was therefore necessary to teach them the nobility of, lab of labour. As another example, the government appointed Director um, of Education, Thomas Strong, from the late 1920s to the 1930s, and um, he was surprised and disturbed to find that in some schools, Māori were allowed to learn the intricacies of numerical calculations, and he war warned, and I quote, the dark races, um, warned educating and encouraging the dark races um, to a stage far beyond their present needs for the possible, or their possible future needs, and that was a fatal facility, he said. I think he was obviously less concerned about the Fs than we are. And so, um, <laughs> and so it was that at least two generations of Māori trying to understand what it meant to be a New Zealand citizen were often homemaking, building, furniture making, cooking, and child rearing as a staple curriculum in native district secondary schools. Also, with no school certificate, as I said, pupils could not gain qualifications, and thus they couldn't compete in the broader workforce. Through schooling and then through manual labour itself, Māori developed a certain relationship with work and with their working bodies. Being a manual labourer came to represent an authentic form of being Māori. This relates to what I was speaking ab about before um, in the relation to production of subjectivities. In terms of masculinity, unlike Pākehā men who enjoyed a normal spread throughout occupational strata, by 1965, and I quote, this guy, Watson, uh, nearly 90% of Māori men were employed as farmers, foresters, labourers, transport operators, factory workers, or in other skilled and unskilled occupations. The result of educational policy throughout the majority of the 20th century was that Māori were generally far less educated than Pākehā. For Māori men, it debilita uh, debilitated them in the workforce and later led to an urban underclass that was the catalyst for the stereotype of Jake the Mus. Okay, I wish I had a aha moment to pull out now, but can't find one. Um, let's talk instead about New Zealand's most favourite exports, one of New Zealand's most favourite exports. I'm not talking about dried powdered milk products, uh, Hamilton. I'm talking about uh, director Nikki Caro's film Whale Rider. So Whale Rider tells the story of a young girl, Paikia, who demonstrates many leadership qualities but patriarchal tradition supposedly prevents her grandfather, Paka, from seeing Paikia as the natural le uh, future leader of their iwi, and an iwi, I might add, that has many strong women leaders. In this part of my talk, I want to discuss not so much the film's inaccuracies, or there are, there are plenty, rather, like Once for Warriors, is not so much that men like Jake, the Mas, or Paka do not exist, rather it is their privileging as authentic representations of Māori masculinity that I'm most uh, concerned with, sorry. So the unfortunate things about films like Whale Rider is that they promote simplicity. Uninformed audiences lose the distinction between the real and the imaginary. As one international film reviewer suggested, and I quote, director Nikki Caro shows a genuine sympathy for the traditions of the conservative patriarchal society her film describes. We come to appreciate the rhythms of village life. Excuse me. And I guess this was the theme of a plethora of uh, various reviews about the film. It was a sexy film because it was coming of age, but also supposedly a coming of age of a backward indigenous culture. Yet a genealogical analysis of Māori men and patriarchy tells a far different story. The production of so-called traditional Māori patriarchy 
via colonization is a much more complex tale than Caro has us believe. Admittedly, it would make for a pretty boring film if she was going to tell that story, but it's beside the point. And in his comprehensive discussion on pre-colonial and post-colonial Māori masculine leadership, Maharaya Winiata outlines in his 1967 book The Changing Role of the, of the Leader in Māori Society the kind of inculcation of settler technologies and uh, methods of government within the chiefly habits. That's what he calls. So this is a quote. The period, and he's relating to 1800 to 1840, is important as showing traditional leaders keenly and actively experimenting in their dealings with Europeans. The result was a general widening in the horizons of the chiefs. They now had before them a range of European goods, techniques, codes, systems of value, and institutions to consider. So as I've already stated, late, later in the 19th century, it was a matter of survival in terms of um, producing masculine cultural formations that could actually interface and be effective with the largely patriarchal colonial state. Mahawuniata also makes it clear that Māori leaders recognise the need for their political uh, bodies to include educated Māori men whose Western education would enable them to interpret and then help administer Pākehā governance structures. The colonial policy of creating a cultural divide between generations and the increasing desire of Māori to be able to converse with the colonial system meant that, uh, meant that at least a significant portion of Māori leaders were schooled in Victorian-style boarding schools. As a strategy, these leaders traditionalised a hybrid form of masculinity that was part Māori and part Victorian. It is important to realise, therefore, that the hybrid culture Māori produced was in conjunction with a very particular form of settler culture that we would not even really consider to be Pākehā culture today. Dominant forms of Victorian masculinity uh, were focused around the rational achievement of mind and body. As John Bernon outlines, reason and feeling were separated and masculinity came to be associated with the ob objective and the, uh, the practical. Victorian culture was in general historical with clear gender division lines um, determined by heterosexuality. Male leaders of this time were also highly concerned that the masculine would be contaminated or made weak by the feminine. In turn, the famous British public school system explicitly used sports such as cricket and rugby to inculcate boys with values of physical assertiveness and stoicism. In New Zealand, colonial authorities created Māori boys' private boarding schools in, in an attempt to uh, recreate a Māori gentry who would eventually take those leadership values back into their communities. For Māori, it was a strategic investment in, to enable some of their boys to better comprehend how the, their governors governed. It enabled a very small segment of Māori population insights into the world of their oppressors. This takes us back to why Māori men in particular placed so much importance on rugby, because it was seen as inherently linked to leadership attributes, and more importantly, access to a Pākehā world, which remained largely off limits to most Māori. The hybridisation of Māori masculine culture with Victorian masculinity produced a stoic Māori patriarchal figure who has supposedly represented traditional Māori masculinity as represented by, of course, Kōrupaka, and more recently in the new film Mahana. In reality, however, the cultural formation was strategic and temporal. Yet I do not want to paint Māori men as without agency in all of this. The British society Māori faced gave Māori men privilege simply because they were men. However, it does not appear as if Māori men were entirely resistant to embracing this privilege. It could be said, said then that the traditionalisation of patriarchy was strategic at a certain point of time, but I question, is it any more? And so I ask, perhaps controversially, who is now authorised to speak on behalf of Māori people, and what forms of expression are even re registered as recognisable? Whilst there is nothing inherently wrong with tradition, it is the fixated and arrested nature of tradition when spoken in relation to being indigenous that is of concern. This is especially the case in relation to our academic history in New Zealand, where Māori culture was seen to be dying out and therefore needed to be preserved. In academic circles, the anthropological drive to preserve Māori culture has, has left a lasting impression in academia and within Māori studies itself. 
that is often we have focused on preserving traditions and the authenticity of culture whilst giving little thought in our research to the here and now, to the present, to the post-colonial formations of Māori culture, to the interaction of Māori with modernity, to the immediacy of Māori existence, the immediacy of just being, of living and of doing, the, the existentialism of Māori culture. So in conclusion, the water flows, the water heals, the water drowns, Water's wet seeps like culture, water is immediate. I like the water, it doesn't tell me who I am. I want to conclude on a positive note by saying that whilst Māori men in particular receive a bad rap as deviant and as possibly patriarchal, um, I guess the hopeful point of the discussion, if you missed it, was that we have strategically used culture before and we can do it again. What I find most ironic about my research is that the central aim of colonisation in relation to Māori masculinity was to divorce Māori men um, from their culture, which was seen to be backward, and to model them on forms of British masculinity. Early representations of Māori men portrayed them as lacking the qualities of civilised European men. So I'm going to read a quote by Edward Gibbon Wakefield, and this kind of really sums it up, I guess, in terms of British stoicism, but also, also the racism of the day. He says, nothing can remind me more forcibly of the monkey who has seen the world than a Māori thus relating news. He is an incorrigible exaggerator and swells each minute circumstance into an affair of state. Okay, this is seeming less positive than I, uh, what I originally imagined, but the point being <laughs> that Māori men were said to have woman-like characteristics, they talked a lot, were emanated, were over-emotional, uh, and did woman's work even, and therefore they even wore woman's clothes and therefore in general were too womanly and not stoic enough. The irony is that many of these qualities are now considered to be signs of uh, masculine ma maturity. It is desirous for men to be in touch with their emotions, to be good fathers, to be expressive. If colonial history tells us anything, it is that culture is not frozen in time and that we must look to Māori masculinities that exist beyond the narrow space now prescribed through colonial constructions. So in taking us full circle, I want to return to Māori rugby. The style of Māori rugby has probably, be cha uh, has probably changed recently as rugby has become more and more corporatised by the NZRU and the teams like the Māori team have been used as more like kind of farm teams for the All Blacks. However, and is probably possibly lost now, uh, Māori teams of the past were inherently unpredictable. They had flair, as they say. And this has kind of been used to kind of um, racialized Māori as well, but um, this flair wasn't, uh, wasn't unintentional and was continuously developed through the history of Māori rugby. I'm telling you this because the style of Māori, Māori rugby intentionally confounded the rational organisation and win at all costs that underpinned New Zealand rugby. Māori rugby wasn't entirely about winning, it was about the aesthetics of the game. As Māori All Black 2 Wiley outlines, and I'll quote, Māori play a particular type of rugby. It's spontaneous and exuberant. In rugby, we celebrate the joy of living. So we're prepared to take risks and do things just for the hell of it. In our day, it wasn't whether we won or lost, but the way we played the game. It signals for me that even within the historical oppressive nature of rugby culture in New Zealand, Māori men were creative and guided by their own philosophies. If you would allow me to finish with a poem, I followed his swagger, his bravado, his claims to rights over the others, others' bodies, his assurance, his silent and staunch Clint Eastwood-esque Dirty Harry shuffled back to the rugby's halfway line, never completely though I didn't follow him. I followed him through the mire into the hazy enlightenment of Portiki Stag and Ball Bar. Eventually, <laughs> the smoke cleared. He's just an old boy. Uh, thank you very much for attending this event tonight. I really appreciate uh, your time. And um, yes, thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou. Kātou.